Well, okay, thank you. Um, I grew up loving nature in general, but particularly my brother and I were avid butterfly collectors. And from a young age, I was fascinated by Australian butterflies by this lovely book by Charles McCubbin, which is a piece of art in its own right. Charles McCubbin, um, the grandson of the famous Australian painter, Frederick McCubbin, was a, a butterfly expert and a, a also a great artist. And that's a, a beautiful book. Some images from which I've pinched for some of the slides later in this talk. Um, so throughout this talk, I've got various images. Um, many of the photos are ones I've taken myself and I haven't acknowledged the source of those, but any that I've pinched from other people or from websites, I've put down the, the source of those photos so that people can see where, where they came from. Um, so globally, there are about 18,000 species of butterflies and they tend to be more speciose and numerous in tropical and subtropical regions than in the, the colder, temperate and Arctic parts of the world. Australia has affinities to the Asian butterfly fauna, meaning that we share many of the uh, species and, and at a higher taxonomic levels, genera and families with Asia rather than other parts of the world. But Australia only has 430 approximately species, which compared with 18,000 globally, Australia is actually fairly depauperate in butterfly uh, species. However, within that, uh, this is an example of um, some of the diversity of species that we do have in Australia. Um, but within Australia and um, the east coast of Australia, where, where I'm sitting in Brisbane speaking from, and most of the east coast of Australia is, is the richest part of the country in terms of butterfly fauna. And here in Brisbane, in the suburb of Salisbury, um, we could have potentially somewhere over 150 species of butterflies, which is beaten really only by two places in Australia, the wet tropics around Cairns and, the, and the, that area, and the very tip of Cape York, which has close affinities with Papua New Guinea butterfly fauna. So we're living in one of the most species rich parts of a generally depauperate fauna. Where do butterflies come from? Well, there's a butterfly fossil history that dates back to um, the Triassic period, which was the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. And at a time when flowering plants, which people generally tend to associate with butterflies today, had not yet even evolved. Um, genetic studies of the major butterfly groups of the world have found that the evolutionary history of butterflies dates back way further than this even, uh, with 110 million years as thought of as being the origin of butterflies and a long history of radiation, which really uh, blossomed following the Cretaceous mass extinction, which is the red circle towards the center of this plot, which is when the, um, when the asteroid hit the earth that caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. And the, the, the radiation in butterfly diversity matches the radiation in flowering plant diversity that also happened around that time. So butterflies are renowned for being very colorful and quite beautiful. And this is due to the scales they have on their wings. So this is a, a really close up photo micrograph of a butterfly wing. And you can see the scales resemble tiny roof tiles that overlap each other, almost like shingles. Uh, the wings themselves are transparent, much like a dragonfly wing, membranous with, cell, with, with veins and cells, but it's the scales that give them all their color. And they, the scales do this in complex and fascinating ways. So it's not just the color of the scale, although that is part of it. So the pigment of the scale gives some of the color, but they also reflect and reflect, reflect and refract and absorb light of different wavelengths in very specialized ways, which gives the, the butter, butterfly their overall color and often the iridescence that you see in some. That's a bit of an example. The Australia, uh, this, is a, this, show, this is an iridescent blue Australian butterfly, um, which you, just to illustrate the fact that iridescence is a, is a common feature of many butterflies. The Ulysses butterfly, which doesn't occur down here in Southern Queensland, but does from in the, from the sort of the tropics north um, has a very interesting 
microstructure to its scale, which has been described as ultra black. And basically the microstructure, the, the nanostructure of the scales absorbs light. You can see at the top across a wide range of wavelengths, it's, it absorbs almost 100% of light, which makes it the blackest substance known. And it has been actually uh, copied um, in, by humans as a technique for making ultra black. Um, so the, the, the inspiration for the blackest substance known comes from the scales of this Australian butterfly. So why are they so colorful and beautiful? I'm gonna to come to this movie in a sec. They have a number of reasons why butterflies are, are, are colorful. Firstly, it is to attract mates. So they advertise what species they belong to, uh, to attract mates. Sometimes it's for camouflage. Um, they often look quite like dead leaves on the outside of their wings, many species or other backgrounds that they might find themselves resting on. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's to ad advertise the fact that they are highly toxic, um, with the bright colours being easily remembered by predators that have once tried one of these animals and found them to be either uh, poisonous or grossly distasteful. So the colours act like a warning not to eat them. And I'm just going to switch to a little movie that I found which shows some of this and some other features of um, butterflies very, very nicely, which is this one. So I think you won't be able to hear the sound of this, but it's got subtitles. So you, all you, you miss out on a dramatic American person's voice, so it won't be too bad. the trees reserves in time. The 
his haunts to choose defenses for himself. Protected by the poisons in his body, no predator can safely eat him. And his ostentatious wing colors ensure that he will not even try. his course through his veins. Self is completely protected. He's developing out into his second life as a tiger butterfly. So hopefully um, that illustrated some really important things about butterfly lives. So firstly, many of them are highly toxic and they get that from the food that they eat as caterpillars from the plants that they live on. And secondly, um, there's a constant battle between uh, plants as, with their chemical defenses against herbivory, uh, butterfly larvae, which want to eat the leaves and overcome that toxicity butterflies that want to incorporate that toxicity into themselves so that they avoid being eaten by predators and predators that that learn, that evolve um, resistance to those toxins. So it's like a constant evolutionary three-way battle and there's actually a fourth player in that that we'll come to a little bit later. Now, it's um, quite expensive in terms of energy for butterflies to be able to uh, metabolize some of these toxins and, and store them. So it's quite common for butterflies to cheat. So I, I explained how bright colors are often there to advertise the fact that I'm a toxic species and you've tried to eat me before and it's nearly killed you or it's made you very sick. Um, mimicry is very common. So this slide here shows different species where non-toxic butterflies look almost identical to toxic butterflies. And this is called Batesian mimicry, where a non-toxic animal benefits from, from the um, fact that a, a toxic animal looks like it. There's another type of mimicry, which is also common, which is called Mullerian mimicry, where you have groups of species that all look very similar and they're all toxic. So if, if a predator eats one of those species, it knows not to eat the others. But, it's really quite characteristic of butterflies that mimicry is, um, is quite prevalent. So I'm gonna move on now to talking about some of the behavior of butterflies. So what do adult butterflies do? Well, in a nutshell, they only do a few things. They, they feed, although not all do. They mate, they find a host plant where the females can lay the eggs and they lay their eggs. The lifespan of adult butterflies that you see flying around is often only a few weeks, um, many a uh, month or two, and very few 12 months or more. Uh, the, the wanderer or monarch butterfly, which you see locally and um, which you might see aggregations of in Oxley Common, they're quite common there, uh, they can overwinter. So they, they rest as an, as an adult through winter in, in mass groups. So in terms of feeding, um, many species don't feed as adults, they just emerge from their, their chrysalis, they breed, they lay their eggs and they die. But many other species do feed and commonly it's from nectar on, of flowers like you can see in this photo. And as such, butterflies are really important pollinators of many types of plants, especially those with tube shaped flowers where their long feeding mouth parts called the proboscis are able to uh, dip right down into the depths of tubular flowers to get the nectar. Adults of a few species, uh, including some local species, feed on decaying or fermenting fruit, um, or a, a bit, glass of beer if you leave it out in the in, in the shade on a hot summer's day. And some disgustingly uh, feed on, on mammal feces. And a local example of this is the tailed emperor, which is a quite a glorious butterfly, but has uh, rather questionable feeding habits. Another characteristic habit of many butterflies is what's called puddling, which is um, butterflies landing on, on damp, sandy, sandy and clay substrates, often where there's um, some sort of seepage of groundwater. And they, they're doing this to get 
water, but also importantly to get mineral salts, which can be lacking in their, their diet as larvae they, and they need mineral salts. And sometimes another source for mineral salts is uh, human sweat. So particularly things like uh, common egg fly butterflies, you may find them landing on you on a hot day if you're out mowing the lawn or something, they land on you and start uh, sucking up some of your sweat. Another thing that adult butterflies need to do, and which we saw a little bit of in that film, is avoid being eaten. So we have toxicity as a key method, which I've already explained via that film, but we, we also have many non-toxic butterflies. What do they do? Well, firstly, they fly fast. So non-toxic butterflies tend to be faster flying than toxic ones, so they're harder for birds to catch them on the wing. Often the butterflies have uh, very good camouflage on the outer side of their wings. For example, this common evening brown, which is uh, often seen around Salisbury where I live, very much looks like a dead leaf on the outside. And when it lands on the ground amongst dead leaf litter, it's almost impossible to see that it's a butterfly. Many also have what are called eye spots, which are parts of their wing uh, which attract predators away fr from their vital organs. So if they are attacked, it attacks a part of the body which is um, less critical to survival. And the eye spots uh, are what do this. Many, many, especially the small blue butterflies also have tails. And this is a little film I just filmed in the backyard a couple of weeks ago to, to illustrate it. So they have um, eye spots and little fake antennae on their tails and they actually wiggle their back wings to attract predators away from their head and, and vital organs, then you can see this particular example. It has in fact lost part of its hind wing, which is where a predator has had a go at those fake antennae rather than killing the butterfly. This is an elaborate example of that, which is uh, one of our local species, the bright cornelian with really elaborate um, fake antennae on the, on the hind wings. And so another thing that they must do is find a mate and um, males can have scent glands on their wings and females can re re release pheromones, both of ways, chemical ways of finding mates. Some species, the males fly to the highest hill in the area and it's called hill topping and they aggregate there and then the females come to the top of the hill to find the males. I'm going to show you this one now. Uh, many males are territorial. Uh, these are two common egg fly males in our garden a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're territorial and if a, another individual of the same species or even different species comes into their space, um, they'll fight it and chase it off. And these are, these are two, two males having an aerial battle to, for supremacy over the particular nice sunny spot in our front garden. Okay, I'm just going to switch now very quickly to another film, which, where is it? Is it that one? No, I've actually lost my other film. Doesn't matter, I'll just go on without it. Um, I don't know what happened to it. Oops, sorry go back to where I was. Um, I was just going to show you um, colonial butterflies where the males emerge from their pupae before the females and they all just hang around and wait for the females to come out and then they mate with them the instant they emerge before they've even um, hardened their wings to fly. So once they find a mate, you'll often see a pair of butterflies, a male and a female mating while they're flying around on the wing. And here's just a couple of examples of local ones where that, that could be seen. I'm going to now quickly go through the life cycle of a butterfly, which I'm sure we, we all know. Um, it's that egg, caterpillar, uh, chrysalis, adult. Um, the, the egg, some females are born with all their eggs that they, they've got to lay fully developed, whereas others that are longer lived, such as the wanderer or the common crow butterfly, um, develop more eggs throughout their lives so they can sequentially spawn. Um, females are very specific about what host plant they will lay their eggs on. That's because of the, these relationships between 
uh, toxicity and different species. So pretty much every butterfly species has a set of host plants, which are the only ones that they can successfully rear their caterpillars on. Um, so females are able to identify the correct species of plant by a number of cues, such as the shape and the color of the leaves, but it very especially, they have um, taste sensors on their feet, similar to uh, taste buds on our tongue, which allow them to test the chemical composition of plants. And it's more the chemical composition than anything else, which determines whether it's a suitable plant for the female to lay an egg on. Um, what we can see here is a butterfly laying egg on some flowers of a, of a plant. And often the flowers or the fruits are selected for young caterpillars rather than old leaves as they're more palatable and less toxic for caterpillars to feed upon. So females are also able to evaluate the amount of food available on a, on a particular plant by inspecting the quantity of leaves and the quality of the leaves on the plant and um, checking for the presence of existing uh, eggs and caterpillars of the same species. So it's, it's a very complicated business for a female butterfly deciding where and when to lay her eggs and on which plant. So once she has done this, this is a, um, a mass egg laying, which is not, not all species. Many species lay single eggs on different leaves. Some species lay groups of eggs like this, but on average, um, most, of the, most of the caterpillars that hatch from butterfly eggs are going to die. And only on average about 2% make it to be adult butterflies. Um, the reason for this is there are many predators and many parasites that attack butterfly eggs, larvae and pupae. So spiders eat a lot of um, caterpillars. Uh, predatory bugs like this assassin bug eat a lot of caterpillars. Um, paper wasps are a huge predator of butterfly caterpillars. Birds, of course, eat them. Um, and then there's a lot of parasites. Now you can see these white eggs laid on this caterpillar. This is actually a moth rather than a butterfly, but don't, that doesn't matter for illustrating the point. They're um, parasitic wasp or fly eggs. So they will they will hatch either on the caterpillar or once it pupates into a chrysalis and they actually eat, they actually eat the, the animal alive. And then instead of getting a butterfly emerge from the chrysalis, you, you get a little family of wasps or parasitic flies emerge. So that's really quite common. Um, so just like the adult butterflies, caterpillars have to have strategies to avoid being eaten. And the obvious one is um, toxins again from the food plant. That's often the reason why butterflies are associated with certain food plants is because they're able to assimilate and not be affected by the toxins that the plant produces. But there's also uh, camouflage looking like leaves and stems. Uh, this one looks very much like the leaf. Uh, the orchard swallowtail small stage caterpillars look like bird droppings so that predators avoid eating them. They can often be foul smelling um, or have foul tasting chemicals, which they obtain from the, their food. And many species, particularly the small blue butterflies have uh, symbiotic or mutualistic relationships with ant species. And the, uh, the, the caterpillar and the pupae actually secrete sugars for the ants to eat and the ants protect them from predators and, and stop them from being eaten. So both, both sides benefit from the ar arrangement. And it's often very uh, particular species of ants with particular species of butterflies and particular plants. So it's like a three-way interaction. So caterpillars grow very quickly. That's all they really do is eat. And they grow by shedding their outer skin or the exoskeleton and hardening a new one. They mostly do this four times. So they have five instars, they're called, or five stages. Um, we saw a little bit in the movie about how plants fight back. For example, once they start being chewed, they can increase toxin levels in response to leaf damage. Um, they can even detect the presence of eggs and increase toxin levels. And some of them, which is pretty amazing, release chemicals when they're damaged, which uh, hormones, pheromones, which attract predatory and parasitic 
wasps and flies to, to kill the caterpillars. So like I said, it's a constant battle. It's a battle between the plants, the herbivorous caterpillars, um, predators that eat them, and also parasites that keep all this in balance. So the next stage after the caterpillar is the chrysalis or the pupa. And pupation means shedding the caterpillar skin while remaining attached, which is a very complex process. Um, this, this is a caterpillar that's just starting that process to become a pupa. They attach to a hard substrate with a very special type of tough silk. Um, and they're typically, the, the, the pupae are typically camouflaged. What happens inside is metamorphosis, which I'm sure everyone's heard about, but it's pretty amazing. So the, the, the tissues and the cells of the caterpillar break down into a, a, a goopy soup of cells and organic compounds, which then miraculously reform into a completely changed form, which is the adult butterfly. And you can see uh, in this particular picture, you can see the wings and, and the, the abdomen, thorax abdomen developing on this on this uh, inside this pupa. They then emerge. They emerge from the um, from the chrysalis. It breaks out of the pupal skin with soft folded wings, and it needs to pump liquid into them to uh, expand and harden their wings, which they can have to do before they can fly. Which is a process that can take anything from minutes to hours, depending on the species and the conditions. Some. Some species uh, need to have hibernation or diapause stages in their life cycle. So they, they're not constantly uh, going through that life cycle, they, they pause it. So for example, um, they can pause at any stage, they can cause as eggs, as larvae or as pupae. And some species can even skip multiple years as pupae um, before they emerge. So they, they, they pupate one year, skip the whole next year, and then emerge as a butterfly the year after. They really do have what's known as a boom and a bust ecology. Um, it's very obvious here in Brisbane. If it's a, a wet year like we're having now, there's butterflies everywhere. Um, lots of butterflies, high abundance. But if there's a dry year, there's hardly any. Um, and this is based on the availability of fresh growth of the food plants, because really, in most cases, the caterpillars re rely on new young growth of the host plants uh, leaves to provide them with food. And it's all part of this constant battle between plants, caterpillars and parasites, which is now we're seeing being mediated by the weather. All right, I'm gonna now skip to um, going through some of the butterflies you're likely to see around Brisbane. And I've, I've concentrated where I live in Salisbury. Most of the species that I'm showing you here are ones that, have, that you can see at times in our suburb here. Um, I'm, I've arranged them by family. So there's several major families in Australia. So the first one is the swallowtails of the Pilionids. They're large and colorful butterflies, mainly in the tropics. And it includes the world's largest butterflies, which are the bird wings. So I'm just gonna quickly skip through examples of ones you're likely to see in your own gardens or around the place in Brisbane. So the blue triangle, this is what the, the blue triangle's caterpillar looks like. This is a pale triangle, a close relative, and that's what its caterpillar looks like. This is a checkered swallowtail. Um, you don't often see them landed, but they are around Salisbury flying low, often like not far above the, the footpath because their food plant is a, a little uh, low, low, low herby weed that often grows in footpaths. Orchard swallowtail, very conspicuous this summer, um, breed on introduced as well as native citrus plants very large, a dainty swallowtail, Fuscus swallowtail, all, all three of those last three species all breed on citrus. Uh, one of my favorites, the Maclay swallowtail, not so common in Brisbane, but potentially see, seen in Brisbane, more common in the cooler high altitude uh, mountainous areas around Brisbane. And Richmond birdwing, um, again, not likely to see it in Salisbury, but Historically, they were quite common in Brisbane, especially where there was a uh, lowland rainforest along the rivers. And there's been a, a large effort to plant their food plant all around Southeast Queensland. So there's, I've never seen one in Brisbane, but it's possible that you could. 
Next is the perids, which are the whites and yellows. They're medium butterflies. Uh, they're, they're mainly tropical again, and their color is, as the name suggests, white, yellow, or orange. They often have black on, the, on their wings as well. So this is a very common one here, a lemon migrant. I'm sure you've all seen lots of them flying around. They're quite active, fast flying butterflies. This is what their caterpillar looks like. Uh, yellow albatross. Caper gull. And these guys, the caper white, is one of the species that locally can undergo mass migration. So at certain years, um, you can see literally thousands of these flying around Brisbane. Uh, they tend, it tends to be when they've had a very bumpy year of breeding and their food plant mostly grows west of the Great Dividing Range. But if the caterpillars have exhausted all the leaves on the food plant, the adults that emerge fly off to try and find new food plants. And that's why when you see this mass migration happening. Uh, grass yellow, there's, a, there's several species of grass yellows which look superficially quite similar. This is the small grass yellow. And these beauties, um, Jezebels are a group of butterflies that breed on mistletoes. Um, and because they breed on mistletoes, they're highly toxic. And because mistletoe leaves are highly toxic and they're extremely brightly colored, all of them. Um, this is a black Jezebel, which is quite common around Salisbury. And I want you to just take note of the sort of general pattern of this because the next butterfly from a different family is, a, is one of these Batesian mimics of this species, which is, means it looks like it, but it's not toxic. So the next family are the, the nymphs. Um, they're, they're brightly colored. Um, they have reduced four legs. So it looks like they've only got four legs, a lot of them instead of six. Often the underside of the wings when they land are dull and camouflaged, but they often open their wings when they're landed. So you can see the, the colorful insides when they're landed quite readily. So this is the Jezebel nymph, which is the mimic of the black Jezebel. So this is a non-toxic species, which looks superficially quite like the toxic Jezebel. Um, Saw one of these in Salisbury like less than a week ago. So they're around at the moment. The wanderer or the monarch, very famous butterfly. Um, it's not really introduced to Australia, but it's not native to Australia either, which is a bit paradoxical. But the food plant of this species, which is the milkweed, was introduced into Australia accidentally um, as a pasture weed. And the butterfly migrated here by itself. So no one introduced the butterfly, but they did introduce the food plant. This is what its caterpillar looks like. This is the tailed emperor, which I mentioned before, uh, likes to eat um, decomposing rotting fruit and also mammal feces. Very beautiful, but slightly gross in its habits. This is its rather charming um, caterpillar, which I always think looks a bit like a tr triceratops crossed with a, with a caterpillar. And this is um, its pupa, which I took a photo of just last weekend here in Salisbury. Bordered rustic, uh, more of a northern species, but they have been around Salisbury the last few summers. White banded plain, buried egg fly. This is the one I, that you saw having the aerial dogfight between two males. This is the female, which is the very variable in color, but often has orange and white spots on the inside of its wings. And here is the beautiful male, which are pretty much always white spots surrounded by iridescent purple. The evening brown, which we've already discussed. And this is the caterpillar of the evening brown, which feeds on long blady type grasses. Meadow argus, that's its caterpillar. Painted lady, very pretty, but quite common. Uh, yellow admiral, this, this is a photo Alicia took just last week. Glasswing, so glasswing, this is a bit of an illustration of what um, the raw butterfly wing looks like without any scales on it, which is pretty much transparent and membranous. So this naturally has parts of its wing that don't have scales. A blue tiger, another one that can undergo mass migrations locally at times. Swamp tiger, common crow, very, very, very common ar around Brisbane. Um, you see them everywhere. 
purple crow, less common, but very pretty or iridescent purple on the inside. Orange ringlet, this is quite, quite common in, in bushland settings. Uh, this is in Tui Forest, this one. A lesser wanderer, the part of a Mullerian mimicry group with the, with, with the wanderer or, or monarch, where they look superficially quite similar and they're both toxic. Very beautiful blue Argus. Now the next family is a huge family of species. Um, they're smaller, they're, the inside of their wings are often iridescent blue and the underside often has complex patterns of brown, gray and white. And they often close their wings when they land and wiggle their hind wings up and down like we saw in that short film earlier. So this is one of my favorites that breed in our garden, the uh, small green banded blue, uh, absolutely beautiful butterfly. That's its caterpillar. Common penciled blue, another lovely one with a great name, the Indigo Flash. Sounds like it should be a superhero. The Bright Cornelian, another stunning local butterfly. Inside of this one is uh, bright fire red. Zebra blue or Plumbago blue is its other name. That's its caterpillar. The purple Moonbeam. Hairy line blue, white banded line blue, large purple line blue. As you can see, there's a lot of different species of line blues and they can be quite difficult to tell apart, but quite a few of them occur locally. Common grass blue, these are tiny little fellas that breed on things like clover in the grass. Tiny grass blue, Australia's smallest butterfly, I think. Black spotted grass blue. And now the final family is the skippers, the Hesperids. They're, there's a lot of species. They're very quick flying. They're often brownie orange color and they're very difficult to identify because many species look very similar as you'll see in these next few photos. So this one's called a splendid ochre. That's its caterpillar. They make a little home inside a lamandra leaf and use silk to sort of tie the edges together as a shelter. Wide brand grass dart, green grass dart, and narrow brand grass dart, all extremely difficult to tell apart from each other. Orange palm dart, like the name suggests, they, the caterpillars breed on the leaves of palm trees. All right, so that's a quick overview of some of the more likely to see butterflies around Brisbane. Um, if you're not in Brisbane, you probably see other types that I haven't covered. Um, so I just wanted to go through now a little bit about resources to find out more. So there, there's a Queensland club called the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club. Um, they have a newsletter which comes out monthly, which is full of information about butterflies and other insects and other invertebrates. Um, they've got a really great website. Some of the pictures I didn't have of my own, I, I borrowed from their website. Um, they organize excursions and they have really knowledgeable people on those excursions who can teach new newcomers a lot about plants and butterflies. So I'd recommend if you're interested following up on them. That's their magazine called Metamorphosis. It's like a journal um, with quite scientific articles as well as stories and, and field trip excursion reports and things. And um, there's a couple of books the Field Guide to Australian Butterflies by Braby is the one I, I think is the, the easiest to use and, and best identification guide. And there's also this wonderful little book that the um, John Moss and other members of the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club put out and update regularly, which is Butterfly Host Plants of Southeast Queensland, which is basically a summary by plant species or by butterfly species of all the different plants that are known to host the caterpillars of each species. So if you're interested in growing butterflies, which we'll talk a bit more about in a minute, this is almost an essential guide for the local area of Southeast Queensland to know which plants to try and grow to attract which species of butterflies. There's the Australian Entomological Supplies, which has been around forever and have everything you could hope for to, to um, study or raise insects. So I'd recommend checking them out. Now I'm going to quickly, this is obviously quite superficial because there's hundreds of plants and hundreds of butterflies 
I'm just going to go through some of the plants that you could potentially grow in your garden to attract um, local butterflies. And it's basically a situation of grow them and they will come. So when we first started our garden here in Salisbury, we, we planted as many of these types of host plants as we could. And over the years, um, we've pretty much had most of the species of butterflies that we'd hope to attract come to the garden and breed on these plants. So growing the host plants is the most important thing for attracting butterflies to your garden. And local host plants are the most critical thing. Um, butterfly, many species also feed on nectar. So it's, it's helpful to have a range of, of native flowering plants in your garden as well to provide food for the adults. Um, it's often the case that native flowering plants are much better for insects than showy exotic flowering plants because often the showy exotic flowering plants have been selectively bred for their appeal to humans and they've actually lost their value as providing nectar to wildlife. So try and stick um, to the local native flowering plants if you can. So I'm going to go fairly quickly through these and some of these pictures are from that McCubbin book that I mentioned, which is, is a beautiful artistic butterfly book from the 1970s, um, but so it's still lovely to look at. Right, so the Brisbane wattle is the host to the imperial hair streak, which is the colonial butterfly I was going to show you the film of that disappeared on me. So they, they, only can, they, they only can use the host plant if there's also the right type of ant growing in your garden. Um, Yellow albatross lives, breeds on the native holly, which is a lovely plant, which looks very much like a European holly. Um, one of my favorites, like I said, the small grander, grander blue grows on the Alphatonia excelsa, which is a local soap tree, um, a very common local tree, easy to grow, and, and the butterfly is just spectacular, small but lovely. Here we see the bright cornelian, the indigo flash, and some, some other of the smaller blues, which all breed on the ivory curl or Buckinghamia tree, which is quite common in Brisbane as a street tree and in people's gardens. So it's a good one to grow. Um, common crow, which I said was one of the most common butterflies around Brisbane. This is one of its food plants. It's got quite a few. This is a currant bush, Carissa ovata. Um, the lemon migrant breeds feeds on several different types of cassias, and this is one of the ones which is uh, particularly good for it is the velvet cassia, cassia tomentella. It grows into a reasonably sized tree. Um, painted lady butterfly likes daisies, so the billy buttons daisy is um, is one, and it's it's a nice little garden little garden herby sort of plant you can grow. The native finger lime is a great plant for all of the citrus loving butterflies. Um, so we've got the orchard dainty and fuscus swallowtails all breed on the native finger lime. And as an advantage, you also get the delicious, yummy finger lime fruit, which I can recommend for making uh, gin and tonics an excellent, excellent summer's drink. Emu's foot is the host plant of the checkered swallowtail. It's a small herb that often grows wild on people's footpaths or verges. Um, it's, a, it's a good plant to try and grow. One of the skippers, the dusk flat, which as the name suggests, comes out around dusk. Um, this is the native guava, another very interesting plant, a very primitive um, flowering plant, and this one, but locally native. Oh, we've got this one in our front garden and the, the berries of this, the orange berry or glycosmus, um, are delicious to eat. They're, they're quite small, but they're really quite delicious and even the children like them. Um, and it's again, host plant to the orchard and fuscus swallowtail butterfly. So this is a great one to try and get hold of. It's not a huge tree. It says it grows to eight meters, but ours is probably only two meters. Wax flower or Hoya australis, a beautiful ornamental plant, which is also a host plant for the common crow butterfly. I'm, I'm sure most people know lamandras or mat rushes. They, they grow along creeks all over the place, but also in people's gardens. And they're, they're host to a number of the more attractive um, skipper butterflies. This one, we also have in the garden uh, zigzag vine. Um, it 
claims to have edible orange fruit, but they don't taste very nice to me. But the amazing thing about the flowers is they smell exactly like fake banana essence. It's a very strong flower. And this is, um, this is a host plant for a really lovely butterfly called the four-barred swallowtail, which you can see on the right there, as well as, um, as well as the pale triangle and the dusk flat again. Another one for the citrus lovers is the limeberry micromelium. Uh, the Neolitia dalbata or bolly gum, I, I, call, I used to call them Brahmin bush because the leaves hang down a bit like the ears of a Brahmin cow. Um, they're a good one for the blue triangle butterfly. Our friend, the the um, tailed emperor and some little, some of the little line blues like this one, the snowwood. The famous Richmond bedwing vine. The vine is actually named after the butterfly. This is um, available in a lot of nurseries to try and encourage people to plant them in Brisbane to bring back the um, Richmond birdwing. Uh, here we have the Jezebel nymph, which I mentioned, as well as the indigo flash and um, yellow admiral, which all breed on the native mulberry, Pipteris argenteus. Uh, we have also have that in our garden. And um, you got to, if you're buying one, they, they come as either a male or a female tree. So you only get the fruit, which is edible and, and reasonably pleasant if you have a female tree. But you can see how some of the artwork from that McCubbin book is quite glorious. Um, in the backgrounds to the butterflies and so forth. Native plumbago, this is the plumbago or zebra blue butterfly. It also breeds on the introduced plumbago, um, which is probably more common in gardens, but the native plumbago is native to the area. So it's a good plant to have. Small herb called a love flower, Pseudoranthrum variable, um, is a host plant for both the um, egg fly and the Australian leaf wing. I've, I've never seen a leaf wing in Salisbury, but other parts of Brisbane, they've been around this wet summer. They're, they're a bit, little bit like the evening brown, but they're much brighter on the inside, much really quite a flame-like orange color on the inside when you see one in real life. Uh, various centers and cassias are food plants for a lot of the yellow butterflies. So this one, the rainforest center, center of Clinus, is food plant for uh, quite a few. The lemon, mi yellow migrant, sorry, different from the lemon migrant and the grass yellows, two of the grass yellows. And this is another migrant, the white migrant, which is on this rather pleasant looking um, pepper leafed senna, which is senna sephira. It's a nice shrub, so that's a good one. Uh, smooth darling pea is home to a rather nice tailed pea blue butterfly and also grass yellows. Now, that was just a really quick zip through some plants that you could grow in your garden, but of course you wanna know where you can get them. Um, there's an organization called Native Plants Queensland, which used to, be, used to be called the Society for Growing Native Plants, I believe. So they've got a website and they have nurseries at various places like at Logan. Um, the one where like we ran a butterfly host plant stall at the Salisbury State School 100 year fate last year. And we, we had um, over 200 plants that donated by Patton Park Native Nursery. And all of the species I've highlighted in my talk just here now, they supplied all of those species and they had many more. So that's a really excellent one there at the Gap. Um, Fair Hills Nursery at near Yandina, uh, Nielsen's Nursery at Logan, and I, I don't know Daly's native nursery personally, but it's another one that specializes in native plants and is likely to have a lot of um, butterfly host plants. But once again, I'd recommend if you want to try and um, work out what species to get before you go to one of these nurseries, uh, this book from the Butterfly and Other Invertebrates Club about that tells you which butterflies go on which plants is, is an invaluable resource. And now coming to the end, um, the blurb about my talk said something about bees, so I thought I'd better throw a few photos of bees in at the end. Um, so one of the advantages of growing native plants in your garden is that you attract lots of native biodiversity. So it's not just butterflies, it's many other types of insects. Um, over the years, we've had something in the order of 200 species of locally native 
plants in the garden with a focus on ones that attract butterflies, but they've also successfully attracted many other species. So I'll just quickly throw a few photos of things from the garden taken recently. So this was a cuckoo bee. And um, this is a, a really large carpenter bee, like the size of a European bumblebee size, going, going to buzz pollinate cassia flowers. Uh, lots of different species of resin bees. Teddy bear bee, which is very cute. Uh, blue banded bee. And as well as many other things like um, these, these iridescent green bugs that like one of the butterfly host plants in particular. Uh, many, many species of spiders. Uh, some quite beautiful species of, of leaf hoppers, which are sap suckers on, on various native plants. And lots and lots of species of, of, of wasps. And a beautiful jewel beetle that was in the garden a couple of months ago. So I think that is where I can stop sharing. And I think I've covered the time pretty well. Um, so we can have some questions. I don't know how we do the questions. Do people get unmuted for questions? Yeah, people can just unmute themselves and feel free to ask some questions to Jonathan. Are there any chatty ones or no, no chatty ones? Nothing in the chat box, no. Does anyone have any questions or did I bamboozle you all with knowledge? Well, it doesn't seem like we have any questions. I, uh, sorry, if I can ask a question quickly. Sure. Um, we've, we're growing a lot of citrus plants at the moment and they're getting pretty heavily decimated by, by caterpillars. Just, 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 just the citrus leaves, yeah. Just, just wondering if there's any um, sort of any ideas as to, we still, well, obviously we still want the butterflies, but don't want our citrus plants destroyed. So um, is there like a, like a different species of citrus that's, that, that they would prefer that we could plant as like a decoy or something like that? Or Well, some of the native species that I mentioned um, will attract them, but we've got both in our garden and they do still lay their caterpillars on the um, edible type citrus trees. But I guess um, if you have a, if you have a, I never really care, I just let them, do it but um if you did care i guess you could remove the caterpillars and put them onto the other plant um it doesn't always work because sometimes if the caterpillar is used to one plant it it can't survive even on a different plant of the same species um but yeah i, I think if you like some of the ones like that um orange berry glycosmus or this yeah some some things like that you could grow finger limes a good one um or you can, like I said, most caterpillars don't survive to adulthood anyway. So if you're, if you're really worried about your leaves, you could pick off the caterpillars, but at the end of the day, how much harm are they doing to your fruit production? I don't know. That's a question for someone else. Great, thanks, cheers. Someone said, um, have, have I participated in the Brisbane butterfly count? So um, a few times, but with small children on board, so uh, not full. I, I said a little participation rather than full participation. <laughs> but it's an excellent initiative um, that happens every year. At, they do it at Oxley Common, for example. Um, I think it's coordinated by the Brisbane City Council, but run, run through different local um, community environment organisations. And they usually have people there who are really experts on butterflies, much more expert than me, um, to help people learn and identify. So that's definitely worth going along to if you see one advertised and you're interested.
I see there's um, another question about, are there any other fruit and vegetable plants that are great for attracting butterflies? Um, so custard apples and soursops attract um, butterflies. They, they are the food plant for the, um, the pale triangle butterfly. Let me think what else. Well, obviously cabbages are the cabbages and other brassicas are the food plant for the cabbage white, but they're an introduced pest species. They're not native to Australia. So people probably don't particularly want to encourage them. Um, I'm sure there must be some others. I think lychees, uh, I think lychees are food plants for some of the small blue butterflies, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which ones. Maybe pencil blues and maybe some of the line blues. So yeah, there are some. And this book, this book has um, introduced plants as well as native plants. So you could look up some of your fruit plants, some of your fruit trees in there. But I, the one I most I know most about being good for those species is the custard apple and the soursop. I beg your pardon, it was a bit hard to hear that, sorry. I was just saying thank you very much. It was most entertaining and informative. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I hope everyone did. Um, I just wanted to put in a plug for the Food Connect Shed and thank them again for hosting this. Um, they're great. They're a great social enterprise organization in our local community. And I'm, I'm proud to be one of their care holders. So I, I feel a great affinity with, with them and their, and their mission. So thank you, Food Connect Shed.